Hello, dear listener, and thank you for uh, checking out Something Rotten. Uh, we talk about pretty uh, awful games in this show generally, and I put content warnings in the description for most episodes, um, but I do want to just do one um, in front of this whole season because, uh, boy, there are some wretched topics that we go into in the show, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, extended discussions of sexual abuse and suicide. So if, um, if either of those things are things that you don't want to consider for any reason, uh, here's just a heads up. It's going to be pretty hard to avoid. Hello, dear listener. It's Blake. I'm a level with you. I, I messed it up. I messed the episode up. Uh, we had a great episode here, our first episode of the Silent Hill season. Uh, we had Mike Drucker on, who was a great guest, and my audio is shit the bed. Um, so the podcast still sounds great. That's not the issue. The issue is we lost about 20 minutes of audio, unfortunately, in the backup. We had some settings wrong, couldn't salvage it there, so we just had to accept it. Um, when you listen, you probably, if I hadn't left a note, you probably never would have noticed, but... Um, since it was such a sizable section of the show, uh, it means we lost talking about a whole host of important moments that happened here in the first third or so of the game. So if we didn't bring up, you know, some pivotal moment that you expected us to talk about or we need to talk about, that's why. Uh, probably. I'm going to say it's why. Maybe we just forgot because we're bad at our jobs. But I'm going to I'm gonna assume that it was lost with the 20 minutes. Uh, hopefully elsewhere in the in the season... We have circled back to those moments and discussed them or expanded on later parts of the game in a way that, you know, covers up some of the blind spots that inevitably you have in this episode. But anyway, I still think it's great. It came out great. Mike was a great guest. So enjoy the episode. And especially enjoy that theme song that's about to play, like, right now. Because I'm really proud of it. I riffed my ass off. In my Hello and welcome to a new season of Something Rotten. We've played The Last of Us, we've played The Darkness, uh, but now we're going to that time and that town that I see in my restless dreams. It's time to talk about Silent Hill. Uh, we're going to be talking about Silent Hill 2 and 3 in this series, but today we are just going to be going until... I don't know, the basement of the hospital where Maria says, anyway, uh, that's our stopping place for today's episode. My name is Jacob Geller. I've played Silent Hill 2 before. I'm a big fan. I'm joined by my esteemed co-host who has been texting me uh, miserably throughout his whole experience, Blake Hester. <laughs> Hello. Hi, J hi, Jacob. On this podcast, we've played uh, such sundried titles as manhunt 2 and kane and lynch 1 call of duty 4 games i would say not worth anyone's time but i would say this is the first game we've ever played that is not fit for human consumption it's too scary i am struggling this is a uh, a true gauntlet i've put myself through this past week not helped by the fact I'm also playing Armor Core 6, so my blood pressure is at an all-time high lately. I think you messaged me uh, just, like, the first time you played it, all caps, this game is evil. <laughs> you know, it's weird. I You never know how a horror game is going to age, and I truly did not expect to be scared within three minutes. But I'm also really bad at horror games. Like, I really struggle with them. It's worth saying, I love the game. I'm obsessed with it. But I am, like, deeply struggling to play it for more than 20 minutes at a time. Uh, so we have my uh, experience and fondness for the game. We have Blake's uh, fondness and complete lack of experience with the game. And then joining us today, a very special guest, a man who is, I assume, not writing for uh, TV or other <laughs> outlets right now, yeah. but has written a book on Silent Hill 2. Uh, Mike Drucker is here. Hello. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is my voice when you hear me talking. Um, <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Don't get it that's mistaken. A, don't mistake for me for anyone Jacob. else. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Mike, thank you for coming on. You've written, to be specific, uh, a book for Boss Fight Books, which does kind of uh, a series on individual titles, a book simply called Silent Hill 2, uh, yeah. which I have read uh, and is uh, very good, though it totally does thank spoil you. the game. So Blake uh, has not read it yet. And in fact, you say in the first chapter many times, you're like, stop reading this, stop reading this, go play the game. <laughs> Actually, I got a little curious when we confirmed you were coming on the show. I got a little curious about uh about the book, so I like looked up the excerpt on Polygon, and the first paragraph is just like major spoilers. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm gonna take a step back, come back to this book in a few weeks, and read it then. Right, and to be fair, it is a twenty year, twenty two year old game, so that's true (laughs) this is on me really it's my fault now blake you've shared uh in brief your experience with the silent hill franchise which was silent hill 3 uh renting being too scared to play any further uh hold on no 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 no, okay i apologize my parents bought it for me (laughs) as a child they like when this was when we were pretty young you know we were not the most well-off family that was 50 dollars they spent that I was truly wasted on me because I played 10 minutes and I was like, I'm good. I'll pass on this for the rest of my life. Um, I had heard about this series a lot, but didn't actually play uh, Silent Hill 2 in proper until like 2018 or 19. Um, Mike, what was your first exposure to this series? Um, probably high school. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, I think Silent Hill... Silent Hill 1 might have come out very late middle school or early high school, but high school is, like, everyone was like, man, have you played Silent Hill? And I was like, no, I, like, heard about it, and they're like, man, it's, like, Resident Evil, but it's way scarier. And I was like, whoa! And so uh, (laughs) I played it, and, like, Silent Hill 1 is a scary game. Like, even now, I mean, honestly, it's inspired, what, a thousand indie horror games that look exactly like it. Um, It's still that low polygon PS1 game, like... There are moments in it that still freak you out. Um, And so, I don't know, playing it, I just felt really connected to it. I liked it. I think I'm naturally a very sad boy. And I think sort of like the deep melancholy that's built into the series really got me. So after that first game, I was in it. And Silent Hill 2, one of the things that we can talk about before we start uh, talking about the game is the weird reviews uh, for it, which were... (laughs) Yes! 20 years on, it seems like everyone kind of agrees masterpiece of horror one of the best video games ever made when it came out did not seem like the case did you play two on release and when you played it were you like uh this is great or uh would you label it as came and forward did a big fogging disappointment <laughs> and we stand by that as a as a representative of a game informer we still feel that way about silent hill 2. <laughs> honestly though that's like a good like if you didn't like it that's a good headline um <laughs> yeah i uh I don't think I played it exactly upon release. I do believe I might have got it for Christmas that year. Um, and honestly, I it was so scary. Because <laughs> it was, you know, it looked different. Uh, the story, I think, is a little bit scarier in terms of, like, things that happen. Like, Pyramid Head is scarier than anything you see in Silent Hill 1. And, you know, this was, the, this was before Pyramid Head was, like, you know, a figure in a t-shirt and a hat. Like, it was just this thing. You were like, what is that? And so, and you see him very early in the game. And so I got too scared to finish it until college. I got it, uh, that was my senior year of high school when that came out. I didn't finish it until my freshman year of college because I was like, I can't, I just can't, I can't do it, I can't do it. Uh, so so I think I disagree with the review at the time. I mean, I didn't, I, I, I didn't finish it, but I loved it. I would like to point out, I looked up if we had a list at Game Informer Best Horror Games. We did list Silent Hill 2 as the second best horror game full time. So we have since gone back See? and changed our opinion. It's just that every other horror game ever released scored under a 7. And so just objectively. <laughs> no. Right. Come on, there's some good stuff on here. Dead Space at three, Fatal Frame two at five. Oh, that's a cool that's pick. A good, that's a yeah. good, I, this is a good list. I think it's more common with movies than it is with games. Like I feel that with games, we're always ready to leave them in the dust. But a movie twenty years later, you're like, oh, we we liked Groundhog Day. Why did that yeah. not do well? You know, <laughs> right? Jacob, I realized playing this game, 
I, I, despite the fact this is my first deep experience with Silent Hill 2, I feel like I've spent a life just with Silent Hill 2 and, or Silent Hill in my brain. My dad bought the original game when I was a kid to play on my PlayStation and him and my mom were both too scared to actually play it. Um, so I still have their copy of Silent Hill in my apartment right now. But playing through Silent Hill 2, I realized I'd played this game before up to the whole moment where you get the radio and kill the first monster. I had played that at my mom's, like, the my nanny's house or whatever, who used to babysit me after school. They had the game, and I was like, I Great have played nannying. this specific <laughs> chunk of this game. I don't think I had ever played beyond it. But getting the radio, all of that, I had totally played. And then I went d- deeper into the recesses of my mind and remembered one of those, like, um, like cheat code DVDs you could get or yeah. whatever. And yeah. they would have like trailers and cheats on it and walkthroughs. And it completely unlocked that I had a, one of those DVDs with a walkthrough of how to beat the pier- the two pyramid head fight, oh. I guess, at the end of the game where he like does the whole, I don't want to spoil it for our listeners, but uh, my own memory spoiled it for myself. <laughs> so I had more experience with this game than I thought. Like it all unlocked this the is- other day on top of, as a kid, me just being obsessed with the Silent Hill 3 uh, trailer. Just, just like radically thematically on point for you to be unlocking repressed memories as you play this yeah. game. <laughs> right. That's like maybe the right way to be like, I feel like I've been here before. What is this? Yeah. Yeah. It was so, so I don't remember anything after getting the plank of wood and the monster, but I remembered like the whole run up to that moment and like that big cut scene. And I'm sure as a kid, I turned it off immediately when that monster hit in the radio status. Right. Started. And if you haven't so, played that like, game yet, before that moment, there's a very sad cut scene with a woman who's searching for her dead mother in a graveyard. So even by the time you get to your first monster, you're already like, this is messed up. <laughs> Yeah, I was like nine years old. I'm sure it was way too much for me. I was like, they got Halo too. I could play that. Instead. <laughs> so. um, no, Blake, you haven't. You have not played this game apart from random scattered memories that we may unlock more of throughout the pod. But you have talked to uh, people involved in the development a well, lot. Well, um, so I guess it's the beginning of this year. I ran a big feature on Bokeh Game Studios. Um, I think I think it was one of well they they do a lot of great video profiles on of their own studio but it was kind of a, just the first big profile of that studio and Keichiro Toyama is the founder who's kind of the original director of Silent Hill one but left soon thereafter to work on the Siren series and Gravity Rush but yeah um, Akira Yamaoka is the only one from this specific team that I've okay. profiled um, yeah and uh, just just give us like a quick review as a person cool chill normal Yamaoka. Yeah. Oh man, uh, he's super cool. We, I mean, he's definitely one of the more uh, he's f- big names associated with this game. I think who's like really kind of broken into the quote unquote mainstream, if that makes sense in the gaming world. But like, he was totally down to earth. He took me to this uh, s- little kind of grimy coffee shop. And just smoked like 42 cigarettes while talking about uh, why he likes Skrillex. It was <laughs> sick. He was a rad dude. So shouts out, shouts out to my close personal friend, Akira Yamaoka. Love you, dude. Thanks for listening. <laughs> um, well, then, honestly, I think we should just I think we should just start talking about like what happens in this game. And we can kind of talk about the development and stuff as it comes up. But really, um, the game starts. Uh, you are in a bathroom. Uh, and immediately you get to one of my favorite things about this game, which is the FMV cutscenes are so, so good and so weird in, like, a different way than the gameplay is weird. But just, like, there is this this moment in time captured by, like, what the pre-rendered cutscenes look like and, like, James moving his hand over his face, uh, which I just feel, like, immediately sets the game in, like, this strange alternate reality um mm-hmm. it's it's yeah. one of it is so simple and yet it's just like something that i feel like uh you could not do today because graphics are too standardized in a way we don't have these big jumps between different styles really but that jump between styles is something that immediately just like makes me buy into the weird world that the game exists in yeah i mean it's you know i mean i know that when we'll probably mention it four or five thousand times, but you know, David Lynch is a huge inspiration for the series. And you get that sort of 
uncanny feeling where you're in again very twin peaksy where it's like you're like this is a super familiar place i've been in a rest stop bathroom before but there's also something about it that's like wrong that's hard to define i think it also like and i think this is probably less intentional than the david lynch influence but it reminds me a lot of and you see this less and less these days but like probably i don't know maybe mid to late 90s especially early 2000s shot on video uh yeah b horror films yeah. that were like you know early digital camcorders that just like suck and look unnatural and then usually you have kind of like charming but bad acting in the way silent hill 2 does that it has this like very specific time and place of like video style horror like sov stuff that i think is really interesting and it can't i don't think it's intentional because at the time this is like cutting edge shit but now has that pastiche to it and i don't know if you've already mentioned this but this might be worth it for listeners who who are new to the series the original intention of the silent hill series was that it would be an anthology series almost like american horror story where it would be a different story every time. And one of the reasons that this game, and this is before we go into the rest of it, it's not spoiling anything. One of the reasons that this game was sort of criticized, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that it's a completely new story that takes place in Silent Hill. Outside of a few Easter eggs and a new game plus ending you can kind of get if you really try, there's zero connections to the canon of the first game. We're just known that the town is bad, and so a lot of people were kind of upset. So another thing to keep in mind is this is Silent Hill 2, but we don't know who the man looking in the mirror is. We don't know what that bathroom is. We're not, like, going back for our second round of action. Um, we genuinely are starting off as a man who has, is as confused as we are. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, and, and I think that is... <laughs> I love starting as a confused man. Um, I do want to go back to, uh, I think we should also mention at the beginning, Blake, you talking about the the kind of handheld, uh, you know, shot on tape stuff. Mike, I think you specifically make this connection in your book. And is it is it in reference to the uh, the HD re-release? Is that when you brought it up or is that, uh, you know, because I know you talk about those two things, but I can't remember if they're at the same time. Uh... Yes, I think, yeah, I think that might be part of it. I've also, you know, it's been a couple of years, so I'm going to probably paraphrase myself wrong in some weird way. Um, uh, In the HD re-release of the game for uh, Xbox and PS3, which, you know, for better or worse, is still backwards compatible, so that is a way to play it if you absolutely must, although it's not ideal. Kind, kind of the only, I mean, we'll, we'll talk yeah. about how we'll talk uh, about we're it. playing yeah. it, but like, yeah. Um. They, they kind of, you know, a lot of games from the, you know, PS1 to PS2 era had, you know, fog or little tricks to hide uh, the simplistic geometry of backgrounds, obvious. Uh, and in Silent Hill 2, the HD thing, they were like, hey, we don't need these these fogs and graphical effects to hide the extra, you know, the low poly counts because we can just show them. It won't slow anything down. The systems are powerful enough that we don't need these illusi- illusionary tricks. But you essentially then robbed it of this feeling of atmosphere because, like, you know, in a handheld videotape, you have grain. You have things look a little worse. And they cleaned it up to the extent where you just don't get the same creepy feeling. Like, if the Blair Witch Project, the footage was completely clear and it was 1080p and everyone looked pristine and perfect, it would not work as well as if it looked like it was shot on a handycam on tape. Blake, you know what the real villain of Metal Gear Solid is? Yeah, nuclear proliferation okay yeah but oh oh, you mean giant sick robots no i was going oh you meant the controls for the sniper rifle no blake the real villain of metal gear solid is a lack of data security you're just saying that because we're being sponsored by nordvpn think about it man people are constantly getting one over on snake because his codec is like wide open and anyone can listen in i feel like you're making this sound dumber by connecting it to that game the fact is, VPNs should just kind of be part of your internet infrastructure at this point. It actually is for me, and not just because I'm smarter than Solid Snake. Uh-huh. I've used VPNs when traveling to different countries so I could continue working like I was still at home in the U.S. I've also used them when doing research for my videos, or even for this show, because believe it or not, Blake, what? there's still a lot of websites that feel pretty unsafe to be on. No way. Using NordVPN, I know, I'm not going to pick up some tracker or malware or something, you know? Snake, he could have I'm used... I'm just going to interrupt to tell our listeners that when they sign up with our code, nordvpn.com slash rotten, they'll get bonus months on top of an annual plan. You don't need to make it about video games, Jacob. This is just something that normal adults who listen to our show should use. Also, there's a full 30-day money-back guarantee, so if they decide they don't want it for some reason, 
It's no big deal. You're right. I shouldn't lean on Snake to make logical advertising pitches. Be a functioning adult and just visit nordvpn.com slash rotten to get our special offer and protect yourself online. Was that so hard? Colonel? VPN? Nord? <laughs> Jacob, you know what I love watching on the internet? Blake, I'm going to politely remind you we are recording right now. Movies! Movies, cinema, all kinds of movies from all over the world. But for reasons not fully worth exploring here, streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and the like have different libraries based on which countries they're being used in. Is that true? True as the day is long. That's why I use NordVPN to unlock my computer's location, allowing me to watch Netflix in America, Japan, Albania, the USSR, Constantinople. Oh, I don't know about the last two, but that's really interesting. They added a time travel feature. So you're saying I can use NordVPN to watch all my favorite anime before they come to America? Sure can, but that's not all. Believe it or not, bad actors are doing their darndest to steal your information online. Wait, what? Yep, and you're helping them by not encrypting your data. Oh my god. Annie, lock our doors! I'll explain later! Yeah, don't get caught being a dummy and use NordVPN to protect yourself from malware, trackers, and ads. It'll also notify you if someone leaks your information online, and it helps you avoid those pesky captchas and block lists. Okay, sure, but... Is Nord tracking or sharing what I'm doing online? Never! Your traffic is always protected with their robust encryption and their options to make sure your data is never exposed. Okay, well that sounds great, but how do I sign up? Well, Nord sponsored this episode, so we have a special link. NordVPN.com slash something rotten. From there, you can get Nord apps on all your favorite platforms, and one account can be used on up to six freaking devices. They also have 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, I'm signing up right now. Let me just type this in, nordvpn.com slash something rotten. Probably the best thing you've ever done online, Jacob. Go to nordvpn.com slash something rotten and sign up for NordVPN to watch all your favorite movies and, importantly, protect yourself on the information super highway. What about the information normal highway? <laughs> Does it have to be super? I'm looking for it. Jacob! Would you say you're a generous lover? I, I hardly see how this is any of your business, but uh, yeah, I'm a generous lover. Well, maybe you should bring that to your podcast co-hosting once in a while. <laughs> but nevertheless, I do have quite the website for you. This episode of Something Rotten is sponsored by AdamandEve.com. Adam and Eve empowers people to explore sex and their sexuality in a safe, inclusive, and welcoming environment. More than just a sex toy company, they're a trusted partner in helping you become your sexiest self. I have always wanted to become my sexiest self. Don't I know it. So check it out, Jacob. Right now, you can use the discount code rotten for 50 percent off any one item which is wild let's just let's just be clear it's true. That's, that's that's a good deal yeah that's that's wild that rocks uh but you can also adding to how good this deal is receive free shipping to the u.s and canada and free rush processing though some exclusions do apply on that last point well that sounds amazing but do they have discreet shipping I don't know that I need my mail person uh, seeing that side of me. They sure do have discreet shipping, as well as 24-7 customer support and a 90-day no-hassle return policy. They got it all. That's great. But Blake, did you know that Adam and Eve has been in business for over 50 years and donates 20% of all their profits to help fight the spread of HIV around the world? All the more reason to go buy something. Use our discount code ROTTEN for 50% off one item, free shipping in the U.S. and Canada, and free rush processing. Some exclusions apply. I'm a... I'm I'm playing this on my normal TV, but still using the AV inputs. Um, I wanted to play it on a CRT and just couldn't find one. So I'm playing it on an HD TV, but using AV inputs, which if you've ever done that, looks fucking terrible. <laughs> it's just so grimy and gross. But it makes this game look so much yeah. cooler because it's just like, just inherently, the aud the video quality is like completely fucked up and nasty. And so, like, there's already all... And I'm playing the PS2 yeah. version, I should say. And so the game already is doing a lot of, like, aesthetic stuff to do that. And then my TV just, like, cannot render it in a way that, like, old games... Make old yeah. games look good. So this game looks like true shit in a way that... Uh, in, like, a compliment. Well, it helps, like, yeah. I mean, it rules. Yeah. Especially in dark sections of this game, like, when you can barely see something moving down the hallway... And, like, the TV is doing no favors for you. Like, it really adds a lot. I, it 
kind of recommend it as a way to play this game in a weird way. Um, and I am playing the the PC Enhanced Edition, which is a kind of fan made mod whatever that it's like. There was an official uh, PC release of Silent Hill Two way back in the day that is more or less unplayable now. But like with with these series of mods, they've kind of cleaned it up. Some of the stuff. They've kind of like AI upscaled the FMVs in a way that I don't think looks great. But in general, it looks really clean and really good in a way that I think is like just a very nice looking uh, actual HD re-release. Here is a weird fact that I learned from uh, your book, Mike, that I wanted to tell Blake live on air. Uh, Blake, one, do you know that uh, in the HD re-release, they re-recorded all the voice lines? Yeah, Troy Baker plays James Sunderland. Yeah, do you know who's Angela? Uh, Angela Bassett. It is, in fact, Laura Bailey. So it's just the last of us two uh, showing up in Silent Hill. There you go, go. and there's no further connection between Silent Hill and the last (laughs) of us, right? That's right. Um, uh, I I listened to some of those re-recorded cutscenes. They are truly bizarre. In that it's like they're not they're not bad per se, but it is like the impossible task of recreating the weirdness of these cutscenes where it's like the actors are kind of trying to be weird, but you can like hear that they're trying to be weird. I wonder if you had never heard the original if it would totally be fine, but like hearing the original at all creates such a distinct memory of like oh james is a fucking weirdo and then troy baker's never going to be able to match that camera. yeah and and i would say you know it's not like resident evil one where the localization was so bad that it stilted the acting itself and you know like silent hill 2 doesn't have any master of unlocking moments um so i kind of feel like you know what i mean so like when you rehear it it's not like oh they've smoothed out the script and now they've got it so it like makes sense and the drama's there it, it was it's it's like word for word and you're just kind of like you guys didn't understand the assignment as well or like maybe you needed a voice director who kind of didn't understand english intonations as well so you had a weird record i mean it's it's an alchemy that makes a game like that yeah the the angela performance specifically uh is so i mean on this replay it is really cementing angela as like my favorite character she's the in the best. whole game she's she's, she's so good and the the laura bailey performance i think mike you describe it as like she kind of sounds like she's trying to be like a helpful girl from an anime where it's just kind of like the the tone I, I i could not describe how the original actor is delivering those lines but they are all so kind of ambiguous and like wildly swinging between different tones at all the time and i also learned she's supposed to be a teenager blake yeah did that's, you know yeah. This? yeah she's about well yeah. they designed her that way too like almost so um you know like wearing thick sweaters sort of hiding her body because that's the way a lot of victims of things will often you know you'll dress yourself to seem you know less showy anyway um and so they really designed her so you wouldn't know how old she was and kind of feel sad when you found out how young she was and the voice carries that i think you're right the voice like sometimes goes up to kind of childish and almost you know fun but then sometimes it goes into a very dark lower register when she's talking about you know hurting herself and that's what i really like about her is you're like she's a teenager but she seems like she's gone yeah, through yeah. a lot of shit uh, at this point in the game i'll say i'm de- very confused about everything going on is that is that normal is the game kind of just like yes. lead you okay i i i've heard enough about this game over the years that's like i know the themes i'm waiting for but playing this first third of the game i'm like I really feel like I'm being strung along in a way. I was like, am I missing something? Like, it's even to the point where I'm like, who the fuck is James? Like, the game really waits to tell you anything about him. And it doesn't help that he doesn't remark on anything. Like, the worst things in the world are happening around him. He's like, damn, there's kind of some monsters around <laughs> yeah. here. That's weird. <laughs> Maybe. Um, okay, that um, that's good to know because... It really feels like I'm kind of crawling around in the dark right now. No, you have... It's like every character introduction in this game is so iconic and so bizarre. Where we talked about... So it's like the game starts, you're in this parking lot, um, you, you start running down the path to Silent Hill, and you run down for like five minutes like an incredibly long walk from from the parking lot to wherever you're going and then you show up in this graveyard and the first person that you meet is angela and you kind of think 
okay, here's someone who's going to, like, give me any information on the setting. You know, like, she'll ground me a little. Uh, and she doesn't at all. <laughs> and so, like, the, the conversation that you have with her is, like, even more confusing. And she's, like, looking for her mom. And she's in a graveyard. And so you're, like... I, is is she here somewhere and she warns you that the town has monsters and it's like you keep you keep expecting to meet the person who's gonna be like okay here's what's going on here and like yeah. you never do yeah so i think that that's like i think games are just games as products lack subtlety or ambiguity yes. most times that playing a game especially in 2023 when everything is like exposition so yes. exposition heavy that it, like it feels very unnatural playing this game. Be like, so where's the lore dump? Who, which character is gonna be like? All right, so here's Silent Hill. This is what's going on here. It's it's like very unnatural to not have that in a game right now. And they sort of put it back in later in the series because like this is the one game that I mean I'm almost spoiling other games rather than this one, but it's one of the few games in the series that doesn't have a cult, you know, at the center of it. And usually in those games, it's like, ah, the cult's making these bad worlds. And in this one, the implication is, I don't know. And I love that. Like, I love, um, and I love that in horror outside of games. Like, I love, uh, you know, uh, Brian Evanson's The Glassy Burning Floor of Hell. It's all these short stories that are awful and scary, but you're, but there's no explanation. Things are just happening and you're kind of like, okay, this is what happens in this specific place. Um, I love that kind of horror. I love horror that does not feel the need to explain itself. Um, speaking of not feeling the need to explain itself, Blake, when you were first playing this, the first thing that the game does, uh, it's like you you walk down into the graveyard, you go and uh, pick up this stick in a fairly directed, like, you know, you kind of find your first monster. Um, and then you were just like in the town. And and it's like I was I was both surprised playing through it this time how little time you actually spend running around the streets of the town. But when you first get there, how they're just kind of like they don't really give you much direction. They're they're just kind of like walk around, see what's over here. I was thinking about this and like I mean there there must be things going on behind the scenes that clearly direct the player to the key that you need to get to the apart apartment. But it feels so incidental that I was like, it is a miracle I have ended up in this apartment and not wandered around for three hours. Um, because when you end up in the apartment, it doesn't. it's not like, great, here you go. Here's your next objective. I ended up in there. I was like, am I in the right place? Like, what do I do? Um, in a way that's like, I still feel like I haven't lost, like, getting to the hospital later in the section. I was like, where do I go? Do I need to stop? At, like, do I need to hang out at this gas station for a while. Oh, there's a bowling alley. Should I go in it? Like, the game truly makes you feel like you're yeah. in the wrong place yeah. at every moment. And, the, like, the fog is doing so much work, obviously. Not not just in making it feel scary, but, like, the, the streets feel weirdly wide. Yeah. You know, like, they're, they're kind of, like, the scale feels off, where, like, you look at your map and you're like, okay, this is one block away from me. But then, like, running that block, I feel like I check my map, like, two times within that to be like, have I missed it? Did I yeah, miss yeah, the yeah. turn? And it's like, no, it actually is, like, pretty big. And also just not being able to see anything makes you really, like, second guess where you're going all the time. And if you've gone too far, or if you haven't gone far enough or anything like that. One thing I did not know about this game is that uh, maybe I'm stretching the definition here, but it is an open world game to some extent. Kind of. You walk around, yeah. I had no clue. I, I thought it was way more like linear corridors. Like the streets would, you just kind of be like right, right. on one street. But like actually, st uh, granted, so much is like broken off and you cannot like travel around continuously. But I was very surprised to be like, oh, there's a huge chunk here in this opening that I can just like walk around and see. Yeah. And there's little like, not, not like explanatory lore, but there's little things here and there that if you stumble across them, atmospheric storytelling. It's got some good little bits. Here's an unsung hero of this game that I really noticed when James was running around in the town. Uh, his head tracking is yeah. maybe the single most important uh, thing for being able to play through this game. Because like, the game has fixed camera angles, items are really small, and it is often unclear whether it is interactable or not, but James's character model is so simple, and his animations are so straightforward, that when he 
walks by something and just starts staring at it and his head will follow it for like 180 degrees you know that there's something there in a way that i was thinking about like even in it's one of those things where it's like as graphics and animation has got more complex i feel like tricks like this are harder to do where it's like just having that head lock on and me immediately be like that's what i need to do that's where i need to go except he also does it with maria which means i walk into a room with her and start clicking around the room be like where's the item where's the item and then it's like oh he's just staring at Maria <laughs> yeah. the whole time um so you find you find this key uh we go into the building that says uh there was a hole here it's gone now or whatever which is uh, some a plus weird writing i I missed that building. I missed it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a, an option. You don't have building. to go in there. Yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, I completely yeah. did not see it. Yeah. Um, but the first the first major um, almost dungeon of the game, this game does have, like, dungeons, um, is this apartment complex that you go into. And, and that introduces what I would say is kind of the game's primary mode of gameplay, you know, because it's like most times you are not running around out in the town most time you are in an incredibly dark hallway trying every door and 90 (laughs) percent of them are locked like that is that is my predominant kind of experience playing this game yeah yeah that's totally correct though shouts out to the map people were like obsessed with resident evil 2's map how it would update and silent i had the silent hill 2 map updates in real time in a really smart way i meant the resident evil 2 remake map by the way uh, the map updates in a really smart way, like 20 years before games started adopting that, where it's like, James will draw on the map, this is locked, I can go in this room, this is blocked off, in a way that like really helps a lot. Um, and it is also here that I feel like it's been, it's been present throughout the rest of the game, but I could not st- stop thinking about how much this game owes to fixed camera angles. Like how important those are because like the game is the game is very dark you're often walking down hallways and doing creepy stuff but like what really makes it feel so oppressive i think is like because the camera doesn't stay behind you and often you are running like directly towards the camera meaning you can't see anything behind you because it's dark and you also can't see anything in front of you because the camera's not pointing that way and so it's like you are completely isolated and just like all you can do is listen to stuff and see things on like immediately one side of you or the other which is uh, again one of these kind of like dated things that still makes it feel you know it's like we know there is a remake of Silent Hill 2 being made. Um, uh, you know, this this feels like audiences today maybe are not used to fixed camera angles. Um, but at the same time, boy, they add a lot to this game. Yeah, yeah. It makes you feel creepy. It makes you feel watched. Yeah. I, I'm very, like, I've been trying to figure out the horror of this game and why I find it so scary. Because it's like, even the walk to Silent Hill in the beginning when nothing happens like completely fucked me up and there's like footsteps behind you at one point that are just like genuinely unsettling and nothing pops out but i think the 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 like um basic horror of it where there's just a monster in a room and you need to kill it is so much scarier than something like resident evil and i haven't figured out exactly why because it's it's not diminishing when i play resident evil it's always scary for an hour and then i'm over it and I'm like four hours deep into Silent Hill 2, and the act of a monster being in a dark hallway still scares me just as much. Do you have like do you all feel the same thing? Why is what is this game doing that is so fucking unsettling? I think one, I mean the char- the monster design goes a long way, because you kind of get the sense that these monsters are also in pain. Like it's not necessarily like a zombie where it's dead and it's just slowly walking towards you or a genetically modified. And I like the Resident Evil games. I'm not saying I'm not criticizing them, but like genetically right, modified right, right. liquor that's like, ah, it's a monster. These feel like something happened to people and they're in a lot of pain, but they also want to hurt you. And there's like a, a sadness and and, uh, and a lack of understanding. And then there's certain scenes where the monster is just so gross and repre- seems to... I don't know, represent certain things. Like early on, we see Pyramid Head kind of sexually assault another type of enemy in the game. That's one of the big scenes in the in the apartment building um, that we are probably just about to get to. But it's you're seeing the big enemy of the game 
assaulting another enemy. And so you really have the sense that these enemies, you don't know why they're there. You don't know who they are, but they're suffering and they're angry. And so there's a spookiness to it on top of just seeing, like, gross yeah. monster. And that, uh, they're not, like... Obviously, I mean, they're threatening because they will hurt you, but they feel less outwardly threatening yes. than even a zombie, which is like, I understand the mechanics of a zombie. It's going to come bite me and I'm going to turn. But when you see a set of legs and then its upper half is another set of legs, there's something about it that is so confusing that I think also makes it scary because it's like, I don't understand the threat of this thing and what it could possibly want from right. me that I think is like really unsettling as well. You know, and I also think there is... There is this level where, like, there are essentially no mechanics to get in the way of you being scared of something. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. I think I think mechanics can sure, be used yeah. to create horror effectively or whatever. But, like, when all you have is a board and you have, like, one attack where you can just, like, smack something repeatedly... It's like you're not you're not worrying about like can I get a headshot on this thing? Can I like maneuver around it? It is just this right. kind of like very very simple horror of just like you know, it's like being in a room with a big spider and it's like you just, you know, you're holding your shoe and you have to smack it and it's like all you know is that thing is scary and the act that I have to do is like really unpleasant. You know, I think, yeah. I think it's important that like James does not look remotely cool when, when he's using any yeah. of his weapons, you know, like a lot has been written about like how important it is that this game has simple combat. And, and I agree, but it's like, it's not just simple. It like, it looks unpleasant, you know, yes. the way that he like swings his board down is so just like, it, it it's so just like awful and desperate and that might be a part of it you know the game really does deny you the catharsis of like blowing an enemy away like in resident evil if you when you get that headshot and that head explodes that's a cool moment and this game denies you that catharsis that's a really good point i uh i also think like when you're in Spen spencer mansion or even the police station like these are such ornate cartoon yeah. settings that the setting isn't scary like if you remove the monsters from a hallway in spencer mansion you're just like damn th this is funny but the apartment building is really interesting because it preys on a specific fear of being creeped out by being in a place that should have people in it like you know when you're in an apartment building late at night and everyone is asleep and all the hallway lights are on but you're still really creeped out to be in there or, like, just a building that, like, you might, like, when you would be at work after hours. Like, I used to work at a coffee shop, which is not a scary place. But when I would close it and I would turn the lights off, it would be so terrifying because there should be 30 other people in here. I think there's something to that in this game where you're walking around an apartment building. It looks like a normal apartment building that's just, like, kind of dilapidated. But there's no residents in it in a way that I think is very unsettling because it tricks the brain into being like, there should be people here. I should hear TVs. And I think it's different than like other video game settings where they're like cartoon, like they're cartoon puzzle boxes. This like, there are puzzles here, but you, uh, the act of getting into a door is as simple as I need a key, not I need, you know, like all these different panels that I have to put around that I think is really un deeply troubling to me. No, it's why, it's why having 10 locked doors for every unlocked door is so important you know like it is it is truly core to the silent hill experience to be like rattling all these doorknobs that don't open because not only is it like you know you're running away from a monster and you can't get any of the doors open but it's like it it, it kind of makes the place that exists outside of the playable area way bigger in your brain and you're like i yeah. am in a whole apartment building and yeah. most of it is it contains horrors that I can only imagine because I can't open the door. And then, like, occasionally you get to see some of those. But it, like, yeah, it's totally that kind of, like, I'm not supposed to be here. It's just empty. Where are all the people? That's a really great point. Yeah, It also has to do less to scare you, I think, in that. Like, it, if every door is closed, it makes the one that will open that much scarier because you've built up so much anticipation of, like, which door is going to open and what is going to be there. And when I opened the fire escape and all I saw was that there was a building up against it, something about that was yeah, so fucking yeah, yeah. scary to me because it's like I had been yeah. dreading this moment 
And then the one thing I expect would be a fire escape. I might be able to get out of here finally. And it's like, no, guess what? There's a different dark building you got to go into and a different empty room that you have to deal with. It, it truly, truly like a top five moment in this game for me is just that, that like you open a door and there is just a hole in the building. And then there's a hole in another building that you step through. Like it is the... The term liminal space uh, is overused, but the kind of, like, these just bizarre spaces that you have to go through in this game, where it's, like, the alleyway between two buildings that are, like, six inches apart, and and during that cutscene, they, like, shove the camera in there and, and make you really think about how narrow they are, and, like, why would this possibly be built this way you know like who right. would design these two buildings this way and then watching james step between them it just has this like ominous feeling that you can't you can't put your finger on but you're just like i just know this isn't how these should work i know that something is wrong here right there's always there's always a slight sense that the town itself is a little alive and that I, i've always liked that trope like i i am a sucker for the haunted house is a living thing trope I love it. And so I like that implication in Silent Hill, too. And it puts your brain in such a, like, fragile headspace that when you see what the basement's basement is, it's not that scary. It's just kind of like a small room with, like, a couple drops of blood in it. But when you read the basement's basement on a note, you're like, that's terrifying. I can't. There's no way. That, like... I think the writing is very good in this game. I think also that you're fragile enough by being so discombobulated by this game that when you hear something like, oh, the basement has a basement, you're like, I'm, I think I'm going to fucking die before I get down there. Yeah. I can't no, do it. No, no, I mean, this. I know we already said this, but like for me, the, the, the most relaxing moment in the game is the moment a door can't open. <laughs> Like, when you shake the door handle, <laughs> yeah, it's like, click, dude. click, and you check the map, you're like, uh-oh, I guess I can't go in there. All right, next one. Like, nothing felt feels... <laughs> the only happy moments that are in this game are when you can't enter a room. The only moment... That... and The, the biggest moment you have to breathe is the very beginning where a guy tells you his wife is dead. <laughs> That's, like, the only relaxing moment right, in yeah. retrospect. Because when you do the five-minute walk, it constantly is like, something's gonna get you. Something's going to pop out. You hear that with noise? And then nothing ever does that your emotions are so frayed by the time you even enter the game that it's all downhill from there. You hear about a basement's basement, and it's like, I could just light myself on fire. Yeah. <laughs> and probably someone did down there. Yeah. yeah, dude. What a game, man. This game rules. But yeah, it's, it's really... I think it's taken 10 years off my life just trying to sit here and play this Um, damn game. Something, uh, Mike, something that you wrote in your book that I really liked was uh, you were, you were like, um, you know, a lot of times when you return to an old game, uh, it's like, is this good or am I just experiencing nostalgia? I'm remembering that I liked playing this uh, when I played it. But you were like, but the thing is with Silent Hill 2, there's no nostalgia because it's like not fun. You're not yeah. like, oh, yippee, <laughs> I get to go back here. Right, exactly. It's not like a game that you're like, you know, like, you know, the, the Super Mario Brothers is the best example. You can play, turn it on, play level 1-1, one, one, level 1-2, one, and turn it off and be like, oh, that was nice. Silent Hill, there's no nice, like, 15 minutes you just dive into to feel good about yourself um blake how are you finding the uh the puzzles i feel like the apartment is one of the first places where it's like you kind of have these these multi-step puzzles that i certainly remember on my first playthrough finding kind of obtuse because they're almost like point and click logic you know in the way it's like this thing leads I, to uh, that thing i'm playing the game on normal difficulty but i'm playing the puzzles on easy difficulty and the hints are just like in the moment, they don't seem obvious until you find the next puzzle piece. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. So it's going a long way to just make that uh, accessible. I have only looked up, I think, one thing so far, and it was the coins. I just was like, where's the last coin? But the puzzles are not a problem if you turn the difficulty to easy. Like, the hints are pretty good. I really, I remember being frustrated my first playthrough, but having kind of like, a memory that I've half forgotten this time. I I find them really enjoyable now in that I just like I like having things slot together in the way of like okay, I found this thing, now I know that I have to like drop this uh, thing of cans down the garbage chute to like knock I something hated that else one. out. <laughs> Hated that my first playthrough. That was the puzzle that got me. That was the puzzle where I was like, "What do you want from 
from me! Yeah, because, well, because that <laughs> one specifically, you don't go up to the garbage chute and it's like put cans in. You know, you have to like stand in front of it and then go into your menu and click cans and then click use, which is like a level of kind of forethought that it's like how was i supposed to know that this is what would happen right uh, i hated that puzzle so much i don't want to flex but i got it immediately <laughs> i picked up that orange juice and i was like oh i he said to drop something heavy down there i got this that said i've looked up what the normal hints are if you're playing the puzzle because this game has two different difficulty modes action and puzzle uh and the hints on normal difficulty are unbelievably obtuse. I'm like, how would anyone ever get through this? Have you seen the ones on hard? Uh, no. Because they're... <laughs> no, I... the, the, like, riddle for where the coins go on hard is one of the most inscrutable things yeah. I've ever read. Yeah. So don't let me act too smart. I, the easy difficulty is, like, handing me a silver platter of, you want to just get through <laughs> the damn game? One of my favorite puzzles is when you are in the hospital there is a box that is just wrapped in padlocks that has like three different keys and a combination lock that you need to get. And then you open it up and it is strands of hair. It like, it really feels like it's like, Oh, there's going to be something good in here. And you open it. And James is like, there's nothing in here. Wait, no, there are a couple strands of reward you at every turn. And it's always good. Now you all might feel that way, but as the puzzle master, I saw those strands of hair. It said, I have a hook. And there's a shower drain that is calling my <laughs> name. Very wise. <laughs> I had um, to figure it out. There are a number of weird things that James sees throughout this. I feel like the the most notable one is in... Well, so first, you're in the apartment complex. The place that you find the flashlight is pinned on a mannequin that is wearing exactly Mary's outfit, which is very weird and another amazing fixed camera position shot of like that room but then much weirder is the uh the thing that happens in the apartment building where you go through a room and there's nothing happening in it and then you go back and there is someone who has uh, presumably killed themselves in front of a tv and james is like what the fuck is this and then uh, as mike i'm sure you know like that character model is James. It is not super clear when you're playing it, but it's like, that's that's James in that chair, which isn't really a spoiler so much as just like, right, here's right. a weird thing. Uh, also, shortly before that, or shortly thereafter, before the cutscene introducing Pyramid Head, you see him yeah. down a hallway, and James doesn't say anything. Like, you can't like click you know you can click x to interact with things and like james will be like it's a painting of a landscape or whatever he does not react at all to pyramid head which i found like such an interesting choice that i haven't like nailed down what i think that would be but like it feels like an a, a intentional omission of interaction to be like Here's this thing. You don't know what it is. It is clearly the scariest thing you've ever seen in your 29 years of existence, Blake. And James won't remark on it, which I thought was awesome. And it's standing completely still just staring at you. Like it's not... Bathed in red. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not attacking you. So it's also... It's like you're not acknowledging it, but it's not acknowledging you. Um, Blake, did you reach into uh, the toilet? Just wondering. Because I think that's actually optional. It's like for a safe that you don't need... Uh, but I love, I love how many things you reach into in this game. It's like a weird hole in the wall or a horrible toilet, and it's just like, hey, just do it. I dip my hand right in there. Uh, as a quick aside, this game gives you an unbelievable amount of ammo. I have like, yeah. like, uh, I mean, the safe gives you a ton of it, but I was very surprised to be like, I think I could play this game just using the guns. I don't because I'm too scared yeah. to like run out of ammo, but. It's a lot in the game. It's really more horror than survival horror. Yeah. Okay. That's that's probably good to know, honestly. Because I've been saving them, and it also it feels like it's making the game needlessly harder than it should be when I could just use the gun and kind of plow through some of these enemies. Also, I didn't realize a lot of the combat for a long time because there's no, like, it doesn't tell you that when an enemy drops, you can step on them and kill them. I was beating them on the ground, which actually will make you have to do like three different rounds of combat (laughs) until finally I was like, oh, if I just press X, I'll curb stomp them. Let's talk about Maria, Uh, because 
she's you know you finish the apartment complex you go to uh the you know the dock on silent hill and there's this woman there who looks like mary your uh presumably dead wife she is dressed as blake you mentioned exactly like uh christina aguilera at the what yep. like 1999 uh mtv awards or something um uh, what what did you make of her? That she is w- w- what James wishes Mary was. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, reasonable take, but I just mean more like her. Um, you know, her her kind of lines, her performance, because I find her like her weird sexiness is one of the kind of most interesting things that this game is doing. Well, I I think the thing that surprised me the most about her was that she was not um apologies for this a bimbo when you see like that character and think early 2000s i think you like probably rightfully so you expect a certain type of uh writing for a woman character i found her a lot more interesting and i don't know if she's capable because i don't really see her in the moment doing much other than following me around but she is like a human in a way that is very interesting and like has a hold of james immediately that is very compelling to me it doesn't like She's kind of this object to him in a thematically appropriate way, but she doesn't feel objectified, if that makes sense. Like she kind of has this interesting hold on James in a way that like I find very interesting. In the she she has like some power over him in a way that is oh, she, like Yeah, she has a lot of power. She she kind of yeah. like alphas him immediately. Or like Jay James is so passive that she's just like, yeah, hey. maybe I'm t- talking, I'm not like expressing what I mean very well, but like alpha is a good way of putting it. Like that is not at all what I expected from this character. Um, was this like, this feels like the Maria show when she shows up for a long time in a way uh-huh. that is like very fascinating. There's also a cut scene where she uh, pulls seven different keys out of her outfit. That is like one of the only funny moments in the game, but is very fucking. It's a really good gag for me. Like, ah, it's the wrong key. Let me find the other one. Um, yeah, no, I I think it's interesting the way she kind of like takes charge of the whole operation here. Yeah, and they really expand on her in the. Uh, they're sort of like a later versions had like an expansion slash prequel episode. Although you really need to play the main game before you play the prequel, but it's sort of like her kind of coming to town, you could say. And it's like, it's a very interesting story. And there's also like entirely, not entirely different characters. It still ends with her basically being like, all right, time to do what I do. But there's like a whole story about like a haunted house in there that's unrelated to her story, but is like a fascinating little like side quest. Um, Yeah, I think. I think we might yeah, play you definitely that for should. this. It really expands on who she is. Um, yeah, I I think she is another, I mean, just like could not ever do the lines the way she is doing her lines again. You know, like it, it just just the delivery is is so strange and involving. And my my favorite my favorite scene from her in the whole game, which uh is basically where we ended, is where uh, you haven't seen her in a long time in the hospital, and then she just shows up in in the basement's basement, and she is, like, so mad at James, but then kind of seems scared and is, like, holding on to him and whatever, but, like, James, James is just so nothing yeah. as a character. Like, he is such kind of a, like, uh, passive, does not seem passionate about anything guy that... He finds her and he's like, "Oh, thank goodness you're safe." Yeah. Anyway, we need to get going, and she's like, "Anyway," <laughs> and it's just like, "Oh, it's so, it's so good." And I like that she is, she does seem to be reacting to how bizarre James is as a man. Um, that hospital, it's really scary. Uh, Blake, you messaged me. Nothing bad happens in this hospital, right? Uh, and then it turns out a lot of bad things happen in that <laughs> hospital. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing else I can say. It's just a deeply fucked up game. There's so many new dark hallways, and each one is the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire life because there's one (laughs) monster in it. Um, I think this is where I started noticing the work they do to make up. And this might have a bit to do with the lack of visual fidelity 
It just feels like they can make darks a very specific black in this that games don't anymore, where you can see the out. Everything's more of like a dark blue. When games are dark now, you can still see everything. And in this, it's like you have your light cone and anything beyond that is just like the great expanse of space. Um, there are moments, I started noticing this specifically in the hospital, where the monsters are just within the threshold of your light that silhouette them in such a like unique way that I have not seen in other games. Like the silhouette of the creatures kind of shambling at you is like, very very effective oh, yeah. in this game um and a way i feel like games just can't pull off anymore because like even in dead Sp the dead space remake which is a dark game like once you see the enemy they are illuminated and this game does a lot of silhouette work of like what is that which one is this because if it's a nurse there's a lot more danger than if it's yeah. the four legs you know what i'm saying um and they don't immediately run at you either and you don't want to run at them that makes those encounters so much better um this is kind of the first proper boss fight in the game um in in the hospital and mike my my question for you which is do you have a read on like what this thing is kind of metaphorically because it's like okay we can kind of yeah. guess what like the nurses are and whatever but it's like the boss here is flesh lips which is a cage hanging from the ceiling that has flesh lips on the bottom of it and it's like it's very disturbing looking but i don't know like what i'm looking at i have and i'll be honest i have that's like one of the few enemies where i'm like i don't like you just seem like you were cool to draw <laughs> like because there's some enemies there's a, especially like a, <laughs> like a boss coming up soon uh, I believe, if I remember the order of the game correctly, where you're like, oh, that's an amazing character design that ties it into what's going on in this moment. Um, but yeah, Flesh Lips, you're kind of like, maybe you were cool or you represent psychiatric holds on people so you were in a cage. It's 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 hard to know the authorial intent of that one. Part of me just thinks that they were like, it's cool. It is, it is so... It's so... Again, the simplicity makes it scary. That it's like... There's not really a mechanic with this fight. You're just in a small, really dark room, and there are two of these things hanging from the ceiling, and you just have to run away from them and shoot them. And, like, that's the whole thing. <laughs> Blake, do you, like, struggle with any of this? Do you blast them away? I blast them away. I just don't think it was a very good moment. Oh, there is... The moment right before that is also another good cutscene, because it's uh, meeting Laura in the hospital. Well, you meet her earlier. I, always, I feel like we skipped over yes. Laura. She shows up in the apartment, and then you confront her in an alleyway. She she shows up, steps on your hand, and kicks a key away in the ultimate, just, like, most irritating yeah. character she, introduction. She's kind of like an ever-present figure through a lot of this game, because she's also in the bowling alley with Eddie, and then she's the only reason you're in the hospital. I A broken record. I have, I can't nail down who or what she is meant to be to this game, but she is like this comic foil through a lot yeah. of it because she is so fucking yeah. annoying like in a good way like i like laura a lot but she is so aggravating in a way that is like tonally very strange for this honestly say, the same way eddie is like aesthetically kind of out of place laura is like tonally very out of place for this game in a way that is like as i've said over and over like captivating and interesting to me but also like i've have no clue what she is supposed to be doing or meaning for this story yet. And they do pay. I will say they both pay off. Uh, like Eddie, your your feelings about him are kind of they pay off. And with her, you get you if if you get like if you pick if you like read all the letters and everything, you sort of suss out what's going on. But she's the only character that's an asshole to Eddie. Like in their cutscene, you know, in most of the cutscenes we see, it's either I don't trust you. The, you know, a character saying, I don't trust you, or I'm very sad, or, you know, this wasn't my fault. But this is one of the few cutscenes um, where someone's just outright mean to somebody. Like, she calls him, like, fatso, and says he's stupid, and he's very defensive about it. It's almost like she's the one person who makes him less scary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She, like, she brings him down to size in a way. And she also does that to James because she calls him <laughs> fart face. Oh, that's right. Before locking him in a room with the most <laughs> horrifying monster you've yeah, ever seen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I have theories about, because I think I've seen the cast at this point, right? 
Like the human cast? Pretty I much. I think so. I'm pretty sure you have, yeah. A bit, I feel like I have running theories about what's going on with all of them that I'm very curious to see if I'm correct. But like, I think for Maria, I feel like I have a good handle on, but also Angela, Laura, and Eddie. I'm like, I think I know what these all represent based on just the osmosis of this game over the years. But I'm very curious to see like the ways that's inevitably subverted or I'm wrong or right in some cases. Um, and Laura, I feel like I have a grasp on what she might be. And in my head, I'm like, it might be dark. <laughs> so I don't know. I, one of my favorite James moments actually happens in the scene just before the boss fight with Laura where um, – He's talking to her and he's being very nice and gentle and he's like, hey, uh, Laura, you know, this is no place for a kid, uh, blah, blah, blah. Why are you here? And Laura, Laura mentions Mary and says, like, we were friends in the hospital last year. And James is like, stop lying and like really yells at her very aggressively. And then immediately it's like, hey, hey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. But it's like it's like seeing James kind of like get very aggressive suddenly especially like with a kid uh which is kind of the the only time that we've seen much emotion from him at all other than like being kind of sad um is really striking and i think it's it's like i love i love how he snaps and then immediately like walks it back and kind of seems i don't know um mike in your book you write you write that James is a rotten character, which when I when I read that, I was like, hey, that's our podcast. Uh, but I was I was just very excited yeah. to read that line. Yeah, I mean, he's I'm I mean, I don't want to spoil things. Um, I don't mean he's a, I don't necessarily mean he's like a bad dramatic character that he's poorly written, of course. Uh, but like without spoiling things, the more you go on, the more you do have moments like that where you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa OK, you know, it's it's. What I love about James as a character is the game does a good job of making him so generic up top that you know he's going through something, but he has a very everyman quality. He's slow, you know, he doesn't fire a gun that well. And in the first game, you were a dad looking for your daughter. You were another everyman just in town trying to do the right thing. And so we have those same expectations put upon us. And as the game progresses, we're slowly getting hints that that's not correct. And I think that that's what's great about him is he's a, he's a he's a rotten character both in the sense of uh, but also like he's kind of rotting internally as we're going along. Uh, hearing that's so exciting because like <laughs> I I know what James did, you know I know that that is a twist yeah. coming for me. But playing this game and hearing you talk about it makes me realize that like twenty one years on, despite I I don't even know I, like I've watched so many video essays right. about this game. But playing it and talking to y'all, I'm like, I know nothing about this game. And that's like, it's really fascinating and it speaks to, I think, like, the quality of this game is that even when on the surface, like, especially in this first third, the storytelling feels so sparse. Where it's like, who the fuck are any of these people? But there's, like, so many layers this game is like, held on to that I think is, like, I can't wait to play more. Um, I'm also terrified to play more because I feel like it... I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't get better, right? Like it, it doesn't become happy. No, it doesn't moment. get happy. <laughs> no, I, I I would say it gets uh, scarier. <laughs> but I think that is a testament to this game. Like we we mentioned some of the reviews about it, but it has had this like very long standing legacy as like a very well told, well crafted story in the game space. Yeah, and I think if you play the section we played in a vacuum, you can easily ask yourself, what is anyone talking about? You know, like, the voice acting is very goofy and honestly a little bad. Like, I, I like it, but it's not, like, the best acted game in the world. And the writing is very confusing and obtuse. And yet there's something there that I find, like, very compelling and I think speaks to, like, why this game has a... I mean, the best Silent Hill legacy, right? Like, if not the... probably the one of the best survival horror legacies. Um, it's just actually figuring out the specifics as to why I am like still waiting on, but I'm all in, like I'm obsessed with this game for sure. I think, I think you really speak to the, the kind of like, you know, the je ne sais quoi of this game where it's like, even when the, the kind of like sum of everything you're doing does not feel that impactful. 
You know, it's like there is some level of, I don't know, maybe maybe it would be just calling it kind of like authorship or like, you know, core idea or whatever. But it like it always feels like there is more there. You know, it's like there's something about it that kind of makes you want to give it the benefit of the doubt in a way that I can't say for other games. And it's like it's really hard to say what that is other than just like all of the elements of its design coming together well it it feels like you could single out moments in the game and be like ah maybe it's actually not that good right like there's a bunch of cutscenes i've gotten to where i was like i've seen stills of this cutscene, and then it's playing out and i was like yeah okay like honestly angel in the mirror i was like oh this beautifully framed and then it's playing out and i was like okay so so what's so great about this and then james reaches for her and i was like that's the moment like that was the moment the cutscene hit for me i don't know if that makes sense but it's like no, no, it, yeah, no. Like yeah. when you're going through it, it's not always immediately apparent what's so brilliant about it until the moment hits. Or I'll think about like it's just a hallway with one enemy. You know, other horror games do so much more to scare you because they're loud and bombastic. And yet, then it's like okay, so Blake walked down the hallway, and it's too scary for me to do what is like on <laughs> the surface so simple. One enemy, it's going to take me thirty seconds to kill, and then the radio static will go off. But there's like Jacob, what you were saying, just. There's something more to this game that almost feels un- like what's the word untangible in a way. Yeah, it's like I don't know what it is that actually breaks beyond like the surface of oh, it's just a hallway with one enemy, and yet something about it is so much better than basically every other horror game I've ever played that I don't know how to like actually track down what that is. <laughs> we we are we are basically at the uh, at the end of this uh, this section. Um, here, I, I can't wait to play the next part. Mike, we have been uh, trying to express, I feel like, to you uh, why, why we like this game so much or, like, figure it out. Do you feel like in in the 20 years since, you know, you mentioned there are a lot of games now that kind of look like Silent Hill 1. Like, the, the PS1 horror aesthetic is is coming back. Is there... Like, what do you do to replicate Silent Hill 2 in, like, vibe? You know, because I feel like, as a gamer, I'm like, man, I wish there were more things like Silent Hill 2. But, like, I don't even know really what I would ask for to to get that. I think, you know, um, you, we I think games need to lean into weird horror a little more in the sense of horror that doesn't necessarily fear. I don't mean Lovecrafting. There's, we got more than enough Cthulhu games. <laughs> we got that. Um, But weird horror in the sense of things that don't quite explain themselves, things that feel, you know, not like it's a nightmare as a as as a synonym for scary, but it's like a nightmare in which you're kind of confused, but you know, there's rules here, but something but you don't understand what they are. Um, And I think the more games that explore that and there are a lot are that are doing great at that. um, The more we'll catch that Silent Hill feel. I I agree. Blake, is there anything that you're dying to say before we wrap this up uh no i feel like i feel like james sunderland on this podcast i I lack so much information i'm just (laughs) banging my head against the wall trying to say anything smart but i i'm like i can't wait to like for the pieces to fit into place and i have a better grasp of what is ultimately going on in this game mike i i've talked about your book from boss fight books silent hill 2 people can uh purchase if they'd like where else can people find you or your work uh especially the kind that you're uh contractually allowed to talk about right now <laughs> yeah yeah well right now i'm on strike so there's no television shows you can watch that i'm working on um but if you want to follow me on twitter uh, or x or whatever the fuck i'm at mike drucker uh on instagram and threads at mike drucker is dead um and you know you can find me usually doing comedy shows out in new york city and i also have a book coming out probably in a year and a half called good game no rematch which is about video games again that's awesome i cannot wait to read that one as well thank you for coming on something rotten uh truly a pleasure to have you thanks for having me. um and uh for blake hester uh my name is jacob geller uh stay tuned for the next episode where we will be playing through uh a certain boss fight that i'm not going to well i guess i told you what it is right blake (laughs) we're playing through the yeti boss fight um uh and yeah stay tuned for that uh it looks like the lock is broken i can't open it (laughs) bye everyone (laughs) (laughs) bye
promised you'd take me there again someday. But you never did. Well, I'm alone there now. In our special place. Waiting for you.